It's um, my great pleasure this morning to uh, welcome you all. We have um, two amazing uh, people today running the webinar, and I want to thank you both, Hannah Isaacson and Januka Kozi. Um, I will be um, handing it over to Hannah in a moment. I just want to mention that this is our third JMBBM Frontiers webinar, and we've seen a really successful series of, of really amazing talks and inspirational discussions, and we're going to repeat that today. Uh, we have a full hour, and Hannah will be in charge with reminding Jay Luca to keep on time to moderate the Q and A. Um, as you all know, you've done many webinars. I'm sure you can put you can post your questions either in the Q and A or you can put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring those, um, and I'll be monitoring YouTube as well, and I'll be forwarding any questions I see on YouTube to Hannah for her um, time consideration. Uh, with that being said, um, Hannah Isaacson, um, it's your floor. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, thank you very much, Marcus. Also from my side, I would like to warmly welcome you all to this third JM BBM Frontiers webinar. Uh, I think we all greatly miss conferences and other opportunities to meet in person. I, I know I certainly do. Um, but also I myself, I really like and appreciate these type of formats and opportunities to listen to all these impressive scientists. So today I have the great pleasure of introducing Gianluca Tossi for you all. Gianluca got his master's in mechanical engineering from Bologna University in Italy before he moved to the UK to do his PhD in bioengineering at the University of Portsmouth. He's since then been there and having various positions, research associate, lecturer, senior lecturer, and he's now a reader in bioengineering. He's also the director for the SAIS Global Center. Gianluca's research is focusing on understanding structure and function of biological tissues and biomaterials, mainly with musculoskeletal tissues, and he has largely focused on the multidimensional or multimodal uh, X-ray computed tomography and correlative microscopy and advanced image correlation techniques. And I think this is where he's been instrumental in the recent development within the biomechanics community and especially in the use of digital volume correlation. So I'm really looking forward to listening to his talk. I also want to encourage you to write questions. Uh, you can use, as Marcus said, both the Q&A and the chat, and uh, we will bring them up in time at the end of the presentation. So with that, again, I want to warmly welcome you all and also Gianluca, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks a lot, Anna, for this uh, very kind presentation. And thanks again to GMBBM and uh, to Marcus for inviting me and giving this uh, uh, webinar, trying to uh, share my screen. Hope you can all see it. Um, so um, basically trying to talk again about understanding uh, more on the mechanics of uh, musculoskeletal tissues and biomaterials using this, uh, this technologies, digital volume correlation. Right. Um, you just mentioned uh, uh, about the Zeiss Global Center. Here, I'm not going to say much. I'm just going to say where you can uh, find us if you want, and if you want to know a little bit more of what we are doing and the type of technology that uh, uh, we have available uh, here and that can be functional uh, for, for, for your research projects and for, for uh, research in general in different areas, so not only for bioengineering. But most important is what we can do. So this is just uh, uh, some examples of the type of imaging uh, that we can achieve in, in, in the type of settings that we have available here. So uh, in this particular case, uh, just uh, showing you uh, uh, regenerated bone via uh, regenerative biomaterials, integratable biomaterials. And the interesting thing is how we can really get into uh, the tissue and really get insights on what is happening, or so glimpses of uh, what is happening at cellular level during the interaction of these biomaterials and uh, the regenerated bone in vivo in this particular case. Um, so not only bone, but uh, we can also look at uh, other very interesting constructs like uh, uh, electrospan, a hierarchically structured uh, tendon ligament replacement down to really the finest details as down to uh, skin where we can start to distinguish uh, uh, different types of tissues also in, in, in the skin. So this is just uh, an overview of the capability of this type of, this type of imaging. 
Now, uh, going to uh, the purpose of today's uh, webinar, uh, we have to introduce something. We have to do the rational why we are doing all these fantastic things. So um, I don't have to tell you where this drawing is coming from. And it's, uh, I was just noticing that it's quite accurate uh, uh, despite the absence back in the days of uh, CT technology or any other type of 3D imaging technology. So it is, this is just a, a, a schematic, but, uh, and, and we can see this, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in many different situations and we know about the musculoskeletal and uh, in, in particular the bone, but uh, uh, underneath there is a very complex and complicated structure and uh, uh, done obviously at a hierarchical level. If you go from the whole bone down to the ultrastructure or nanostructure. And uh, uh, to complicate things further, we have basically uh, uh, that we can have other situations so we can have pathology uh, getting into place as well as, uh, as, well as trauma that is uh, largely associated to pathology as well. And then finally, we want also to do something and uh, our understanding is also better to try to understand the treatment uh, to some of these pathologies and how we can help in this particular case to, to aid bone regeneration, but uh, also in terms of uh, uh, bone replacement, where there is uh, 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 the need for uh, large replacements. Now, this is the tissue, and then there is also the aspect that characterizes uh, a lot of the work that has been that has been uh, uh, done in terms of characterization and in terms of mechanical characterization. So uh, you can essentially have a number of different techniques uh, and a number of different uh, ideas on how basically you can uh, go from the organ down to the uh, uh, very fine tissue level using different approaches and different techniques. So um, a number of uh, uh, different you know, techniques, as I said, to, to, uh, to understand the mechanics down to the intrinsic level. But what they all uh, miss somehow is the ability of having full field measurements. So uh, the ability of uh, seeing in a continuous fashion what is happening uh, when you these uh, uh, type of materials are subjected to to load, and this is basically a, a type of technology that is uh, at the core of today's presentation, and uh, it starts from uh, using and combining mechanics with uh, optical imaging, and uh, uh, to give in this particular case with either two D or three D DIC the view of uh, uh, the deformation, so of displacement and deformation strain field, um, basically um, on the surface of the objects that they are undergoing this loading. And then mm, in the uh, late uh, 90s, uh, Brian Bay and co-authors introduced uh, digital volume correlation, which is uh, basically a full field measurement um, similar in, in, in terms of uh, technique and rationale on the DIC, uh, that is able in this case to have the full 3D, three-dimensional measurement across your entire samples. In order to do that, of course, uh, uh, we need to have uh, systems that they are able to uh, give us and to provide us the internal structure of the sample, such as uh, X-ray computer tomography. Now, coupled to X-ray computer tomography, obviously, uh, if we want to use DVC, uh, we need to be able to have some sort of mechanics and to be able to record uh, uh, what is happening at different, uh, uh, different steps or different stages of uh, this mechanical loading. So generally speaking, uh, the, the traditional, let's say, approach is to have uh, a loading device in your micro CT uh, chamber. And uh, then at, uh, uh, in a stepwise fashion, uh, basically load your sample or your material and at each loading step, acquiring a full tomogram. Uh, now, 
Traditionally, this is giving a very good overview of what is happening in terms of uh, visual deformation of your sample. However, when we are using and employing DVC, we can also have the quantification of what is happening in relation to those areas uh, or interesting areas that have been uh, uh, visually deformed and damaged. Um, so how DVC is working in this particular case, the first uh, and primary output of DVC when we are correlating all those imaging is the displacement and then we can uh, uh, derive the strain from that displacement essentially, okay? So first is displacement field, and then from the displacement field, we can derive the strain fields. Now, in terms of DVC nowadays, there are a number of different uh, uh, commercial softwares and packages uh, and other solutions and freewares available in order to uh, basically do this type of, uh, um, you, you know, this type, this type of measurement. Uh, generally speaking, they are under two main families. So one of the local DVC or global DVC. What is the main difference? I'm not going into the details. In, in the local family, you can uh, uh, correlate independently the subvolumes that you are using or subsets, if you want, uh, when you are resampling your image for the correlation. And in the global one, there is a, a continuity that has to be satisfied, nodal continuity that has to be satisfied, and a rigid, uh, uh, basically, deformation of, of the grid. So um, in uh, this particular talk, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on results that we have obtained uh, using this type of approach. And how it works is our approach. Very briefly, you have, as I said, your original uh, uh, volume of your sample and you are subsampling this in smaller chunks so in smaller subvolumes the important thing is that what you need to have inside these smaller subvolumes is a certain amount of those balls or spheres red and blue which uh, are indicating uh, uh, the gray level pattern that you are going to use in order to perform the correlation so if you don't have any is very difficult to have uh, uh, some reliable measurements because what you are measuring is uh, uh, mainly noise. So we need to have enough. And then we are basically correlating them and having our displacement vector and then all the information derived uh, from the strain. Obviously, all this is uh, uh, um, connected or it, it, it is uh, uh, yeah, uh, functional to what is the type of strategy of correlation, which type of correlation function and sub volume refinement and shape functions uh, that is also uh, in relation to uh, uh, the overlap that you can use in your, uh, in your software and in your uh, uh, um, DVC um, code. Um, more informations are, uh, are published. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in explaining, in explaining this, but there are plenty of references uh, uh, out there in order to, uh, to get more information. However, uh, as uh, engineers, uh, uh, this is uh, um, a, a bit of a, let's say, uh, a good thing and also a problem because uh, um, we, we can use this technique, we can use this technology. However, we need to try to understand where the boundaries are. We need to try to understand where the limits are and uh, uh, we need to be able and to ensure that we are using it in a, um, in a consistent and in a reliable way. So limiting the error, limiting the uncertainties and trying to understand what it really does. So I'm gonna give you only two examples here of uh, what uh, uh, we have or we must do when we are approaching this type of, uh, uh, this type of technique. The first is to try to uh, characterize what the uncertainties are. So DVC doesn't know anything about uh, your material properties. DVC is uh, relying on the uh, grayscale of your images. So you can have different type of tissues, in this case, different type of materials and, and shapes. And uh, um, the properties of the tissues are something that uh, has to be known to, to the user or to who is, uh, is trying to analyze them. Bottom line is that uh, uh, when we are using and subsampling these volumes in uh, smaller subvolumes, uh, we have this type of distribution, generally speaking. 
whereby if we are using larger subvolumes, we are experiencing lower levels of uncertainties. If you are using smaller subvolumes, we are experiencing a higher level of uncertainties. And this is what I, I just said before, in terms of how much grayscale pattern is uh, within your subvolumes. And this is very important in relation to the type of material that you want to analyze and uh, characterize, because it is uh, the, the measure of how much uh, of the quality of your measurement is in relation to your error. Another very important thing, uh, and this is uh, related more to the input, uh, which is uh, how you acquire your images before DVC. Um, and this is uh, very important. I just want to, uh, uh, to stress on this point, because in this case, you can see two cases of uh, uh, irradiated uh, bone and in, in a synchrotron and high flux. And you can see how the dose uh, that they are, they are getting is uh, basically influenced. So this is the, the DVC running only in relation to the dose or the accumulated dose onto those tissues. And essentially it's very important to try to have the settings right and to limit these dose. Because if we want to characterize those tissues uh, in, in a stepwise manner, uh, and we want to characterize the mechanics, uh, uh, we need first to ensure in a mandatory way that these tissues are not damaged, uh, are not damaged beforehand. And you know, it's, it's, it's very important because I can, as you can see also on the uh, right hand side, uh, there are cracks just actually developing in the tissue and affecting all the subsequent measurements that we can have. In any case, this is just uh, uh, what uh, we've been doing and what we can do. And it's just an overview of the type of applications of DVC using different type of uh, uh, input or uh, 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 CT technology in this particular case at different dimensional, different dimensional levels. So starting from clinical CT, going down to the micro CT and then to the nano CT. And at the bottom, um, it is important to see which type of pixel size or voxel size of these uh, um, particular settings and uh, the relevant DVC spatial resolution, which is substantially uh, the voxel size times your subvolume size that you are using during your uh, your analysis, and this uh, it must be said that uh, this type of uh, uh, figure here is uh, already when we established uh, that the measurement was uh, pretty reliable in terms of errors. Okay, so you can reach obviously much more than that, but it is always this trade-off in between. Uh, uh, the uncertainty and uh, um, basically the, the, the subvolume size that you can use and the spatial resolution of your measurement, in fact. Now, I would just want to give you an overview exactly following that scheme of the uh, work that we've been doing uh, using uh, this uh, multi-scale or using DVC uh, going from uh, clinical CT down, down to the nano in uh, uh, different type of uh, applications in the musculoskeletal, mainly uh, bone and bone regeneration. So in this particular case, uh, we, uh, we, we've done in, in collaboration during my uh, Australian time at Flinders University. Um, so basically we looked at uh, uh, implant removal and uh, uh, basically which type of uh, um, accumulated uh, and plastic strain were left after the removal of the implant. So uh, and these condyles were imaged before and after the implantation and after the implant was removed. And we can appreciate how it's not only superficial, but it's going uh, uh, actually uh, to a certain depth the, uh, um, the, the damage that uh, these, these implants can cause to the trabecular bone. This can, can have implications also on the stability of the, of the implant. So uh, another thing that I want to, to show here is in relation to uh, this type of technology that is available in uh, uh, some hospitals, and this is, was done at Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. So this is a, a pet cat clinical CT. So simply the patient can stand in there. 
Okay, so uh, there is the uh, full body weight and uh, um, it can scan um, basically uh, foot, ankle, and uh, uh, up, to the, up to the tibia. And uh, in this particular case, patients were asked to be in neutral position and then uh, with those hinges there, basically in uh, uh, inversion and uh, aversion position. As you can see also from, uh, from the video, I'm just rerunning it. You can see how basically we use DVC in this case to have the displacement and trying to uh, establish, uh, uh, not, not only to characterize this, this motion, but uh, most importantly to try to establish a center of rotation for the subtalar joint, which was the subject of this particular, this particular study. And uh, um, you know some uh, new results in, in preparation. They are uh, uh, also allowing us to see uh, a little bit how the strain is distributed uh, in, in the calcaneus in this case uh, at the subtalar at the subtalar joint. So there is still uh, a little bit more work to do. But I just want to show you how what is the potential basically of using this technology also in clinical uh, imaging in weight bearing conditions. So going down to uh, uh, the vertebrae and going down to uh, the micro level. So these are studies that we've been uh, we've been doing a few years ago, so in collaboration with uh, uh, the University of Bologna. And uh, so what what we discovered here uh, using vertebral bodies is very very interesting. I'm always showing these uh, uh, these images to my students because. Uh, it's very important to appreciate the, that difference that I was just explaining before. If you see just only from the images going down to the 50% of compression, you can see that uh, you cannot really appreciate what is happening only from the image. And you really need to have uh, some sort of reading and some sort of quantification in terms of strain building to see what can happen there. And in fact, the crack that is then developing is just following very nicely what are the levels of uh, uh, axial strain that we can that we can measure using DVC. So DVC is uh, is giving this type of possibility and is very powerful uh, uh, from from this point of view because it just gives an idea of what is happening internally in structures and then how this is progressing and is associated to the damage that we can see and we can observe. Same thing, also very interesting, uh, on another study using prophylactic uh, uh, augmented vertebral bodies. And uh, it's very interesting to observe how basically the strain is shifting from uh, uh, the, the, the cement uh, part of, uh, uh, of this particular sample, and then it's shifting to the external cortex, promoting the fracture, the fracture over there. So again, trying to answer to some uh, uh, questions on where is uh, the, the strain and how this, uh, the load bearing is happening in, uh, uh, in augmentation. Um, and this is very interesting to, to observe that first, we have a transition in between or from the cement into, uh, the, into the bone and with the uh, eventual refracture of, of the bone. Now, again, going into the micro level, here I have a few studies and I just want to draw your attention on something that is very interesting and uh, uh, you know, worth to mention. So on the left-hand side, you can see uh, just uh, animation of uh, stepwise of trabecular bone and how essentially the strain it is distributed and then associate, associated to final cracks that we can observe in the tissue. So here is, uh, we are testing and we are looking mainly at what is happening in the tissue. But the other very interesting thing that we've been observing is also the contributions of the canals of all the porosities and the network. So in the middle and in the right hand side, we have cortical bone. So, and in, in, in the middle row, in the middle column, you can see the um, plastic strain accumulated in proximity of the, of the cortical bone network uh, in, uh, in, in cycling conditions. So under 
um, a, a number of cycles uh, applied to this to this cortical bone, and then how this is finally promoting when we were compressing and uh, uh, the, the sample down to failure, how it is promoting and it is associated to uh, areas where whereby the, uh, uh, the the network is disrupted and the crack is just growing through this uh, network in in areas of. Uh, uh, um, basically, uh, higher porosity during during this process. Similarly, on the right hand side, just uh, um, this one is done on cortical bone uh, using indentation in situ indentation, and again at different levels or at different uh, uh, indentation steps, uh, we can see how from the pristine network, basically the disruption of the network uh, promoted not only the strain that we can see there, but uh, uh, the strain is associated with the, the subsequent crack that we are observing then uh, growing in the tissue. So this is very uh, uh, powerful to indicate not only the material uh, property, which is important, of course, and not only what is happening in the material, but also what is happening uh, uh, around or as a result of the porosities that we have in this type of tissues. Um, we did uh, a few studies also on uh, bone regeneration. And uh, in this particular case, this was uh, uh, just a, a rat femur model. So uh, osteotomy and then uh, um, basically kept in place uh, with external fixators, as you can see there. And uh, um, after time, the, the, um, the samples were harvested and essentially you can see the bone regenerate and forming forming callus at the uh, uh, you know on, on, on the on the, the cortical the cortical part essentially and what is happening in here is uh, obviously that the strain uh, these samples were with the, the, the fixators were uh, removed and then samples were uh, undergoing in C2 mechanics again and then DVC and the strain is uh, distributed mostly uh, other than in the sites where uh, where the pins were in in the fixation in the in the newly formed bone. However, uh, I wanted to show this histology image as well because a lot more is happening in there. So it's not only what we can see and uh, um, what what is uh, what we can see in terms of the images that we have because the images that we have and what we can see is also uh, in relation to the relative absorption of these particular uh, uh, materials. Okay, so there are also many other things that uh, we are not able to pick with uh, with this type of with this type of imaging technology, and uh, is also uh, very important for future applications and for future work. Trying to boost exactly this particular area, trying to see also what is happening in the softer uh, tissues. Another case of regenerated bone, uh, following again um, two different biomaterials. Uh, in this case, uh, implanted in sheep models and harvested. What is the interesting uh, bit here is not only the type of uh, bone uh, that has been promoted by the action of this uh, of these two biomaterials, and uh, how much bone and the morphology of the bone, but. Uh, um, we tested those uh, uh, under, let's say, apparent elastic region. And uh, nevertheless, we could observe that locally is, is never apparent. So is, uh, you can see that the, the, uh, the strain is growing and is, uh, and is building up and is accumulating in certain regions of, uh, 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 of the two particular samples, which are the regions of uh, the remodeled and uh, uh, the bone in regeneration, as you can see also from, from the videos where there is an highlight of the 20% of the highest strain in these two particular, uh, uh, two particular sample, two particular um, you know, uh, tissues. And this is very important. It's very important because it uh, is confirming in a way uh, how basically strain is uh, accumulated into the regeneration process, leading to then further remodeling and then restoring eventually uh, the functionality of the pre-existing tissue. Uh, 
Moving to another type of system, it is uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, this was a very nice study uh, published last year on uh, basically how uh, this type of technology, both uh, synchrotron imaging and DVC could be used uh, to look at uh, the cartilage bone interface. So in that particular study, uh, calcified cartilage and, and uh, subchondral bone uh, you know, were very uh, nicely uh, resolved and uh, uh, DVC was applied and, uh, and, and, and strain measured. Now, the problem is always uh, uh, how to look at articular cartilage uh, other than only the calcified part. And uh, we have two main things that we can do in, uh, in, in order to see that one from, uh, uh, from the images. So the first is to stain, but then there are obviously consequences in terms of uh, um, uh, the, the, the mechanics that can be altered from this. And uh, also we can use phase contrast, but in this case, there is another problem related to, uh, if we see more in the cartilage, but we see less in the, in the bone. So, and, and also in terms of timing, if it's not done in the synchrotron. We try to do this uh, in uh, uh, our settings here uh, that enables uh, uh, phase contrast. Uh, and basically we were able in this case to uh, have enough patterns also in the uh, articular cartilage in order to perform DVC uh, in, a, in a reliable way. I'm not showing here the, uh, um, all the error analysis, but is available in the paper. And uh, then we did an ex to test. So what you can see there basically is before uh, the DVC before and after uh, an ex situ uh, mechanical testing, which uh, means the, the, the plastically accumulated strain that can be seen also in the articular cartilage. And very interestingly, uh, at the boundary in between the articular cartilage uh, uh, and uh, the calcified cartilage in, in that particular region. Um, in terms of biomaterials, we did a number of studies and we are doing uh, using, in this case, I'm showing you magnesium on the left-hand side, uh, porous magnesium scaffold subjected to uh, in situ mechanics where the strain is uh, basically uh, measured. And on the right-hand side, uh, uh, dental screws that they, are, they were subjected to three-point bending. So you can see there, we can still use uh, the features uh, and the texture of these uh, uh, materials uh, in, the, in the two type of testing modalities in order to extract information on how uh, DVC and strain from DVC is associated to uh, uh, the, 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 the failure and uh, uh, the damage in these two materials. Another important thing in relation to the, uh, the sample on the left hand side is uh, the, sam the same sample or similar type of samples under corrosion because uh, as we all know, um, magnesium is a resolvable uh, biomaterial and is corroded in the biological environment. And uh, these are preliminary results showing how the, the, um, the sample still after eight days of corrosion is uh, keeping a certain mechanical integrity, but the strain pattern in the, in the material is changed due to uh, the presence of corrosion. Um, this is just one study that uh, uh, I did some time ago on the bone biomaterial. So this is a cortical uh, 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 bone basically and uh, PMMA cement interface subjected to some cycles and then some residual strains uh, uh, measured using DVC. And the interesting thing was uh, just to show for the first time that also uh, uh, the cement can experience uh, uh, some, some, some damage in the process, so not only the bone. And this was uh, very interesting and very important also uh, to drive um, surgical, surgical procedures. A recent one again is uh, in uh, uh, screws and screws insertion into, uh, in, into bone, so from uh, all the way uh, into cortical and trabecular bone and uh, using magnesium screws and titanium screws. This is also very interesting. What we learn from here is uh, uh, typically 
this type of uh, um, analysis and this type of, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the fixation power of the screws uh, is measured uh, uh, traditionally doing uh, pull-out tests. So, and uh, maybe, uh, and also there are some ongoing studies, the titanium is able to keep more and to hold more on that, but is also associated to more strain and more damage during the insertion. Okay, so this is a very, very important point, uh, as well as the one that I was showing before on how we are damaging the tissue during, during the application of these biomaterials. Again, we did it in, uh, uh, we did a bone uh, biomaterial regeneration ex vivo using uh, uh, different types of biomaterials. And here we can see how the regeneration process is different considering the different biomaterials uh, and considering also uh, um, you know, the amount of newly formed bone and uh, uh, basically the, the, the remnants of the biomaterial in there, and as well as uh, the strain pattern into uh, uh, how that, it, that was driving subsequent uh, failure of the sample when subjected to in situ testing. In this case, in a, in a synchrotron setting, again, this is a ship, uh, ship model where all the materials were implanted in the same animal. Another application that I want to show just very briefly is that it's not only musculoskeletal or is there can be something associated or, or connected or very close to that. So uh, these are some work that we are doing also uh, in dentistry. So on the left hand side, you can see we have a brushing model and uh, basically at uh, a certain number of cycles or brushing cycles, uh, we imaged our, uh, uh, our animal dentin interface and uh, we could basically observe how the shear strain is uh, nicely distributed at the interface in between the animal and dentin, trying to explain also what is happening uh, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, when we are not brushing uh, uh, our teeth properly, as my dentists always say. On the, on the right hand side, again, using nano uh, CT, uh, again, indentation, in this case, in C2 indentation of uh, uh, elephant tusk. And again, very interesting to see how uh, the tensile regions uh, were nicely picked by, by the DVC, uh, uh, both below and above the tip, and how the, um, uh, the, the orientation of the tubules, uh, because there were three different types of samples, set of samples, 0, 45, and 70 uh, um, degrees of orientation, they are influencing uh, the strain pattern and the strain distribution. Finally, all the samples that, uh, and all the applications that I, I was showing to you are uh, stepwise. So uh, as I said, we will have to uh, perform mechanics, then wait uh, for the full tomogram and then carry on with the mechanics. Uh, now what we try to do uh, is to try to bridge the gap in between DIC that can do this real time uh, um, basically strain on displacement and strain measurement on the surface and DVC. So what we did in synchrotron was uh, just doing imaging on the fly in situ and uh, also comparing with what could be done and the same type of samples in this case are uh, saw bone foams, uh, what has been done in stepwise condition and continuous condition. So we are a little bit underestimating uh, uh, the, the general behavior and mechanical performance of the materials when we are doing stepwise. We are keeping uh, uh, more or less there, but uh, continuous is very, very interesting, in particular when it is observed, and these are three other applications, for trabecular bone, cortical bone, and again, magnesium-based scaffolds. So the difference, for example, in, uh, in the two tissues, cortical and uh, trabecular bone, is that what we can see here in comparison to what I was showing before, as long as the cracks, they are, they are getting in there because we are loading continuously, the strain is building up. So we don't give any time for the strain to resettle during the uh, uh, in, situ, in situ loading, okay? And this is, this is very, very interesting to observe and very interesting to document. Now, finally, I'm not a modeler, but uh, uh, I've been working uh, uh, extensively with the modeler. This is uh, um, work done in collaboration with the University of Sheffield. And uh, again, DVC is uh, uh, very important uh, 
also to give some ideas and boundary conditions for computational simulation, finite element modeling, and uh, uh, um, yeah, numerical analysis in general. So because we can have the boundary conditions and the real experimental boundary conditions from the DC, and then uh, the models can be can be validated using this experimental measurement that were uh, uh, not available uh, before. So I think I have, I'm concluding this uh, webinar just to say that uh, DVC is very powerful, but it must be used in a reliable way. And uh, the techniques uh, allows uh, a very deep understanding of this type of tissues and also other materials at different scales and uh, have a huge potential to be used in different imaging modalities uh, and conditions, tissues, uh, as well as in combination with uh, uh, um, finite element modeling, computational and numerical analysis, and also artificial intelligence. Watch this space, because this is a very interesting development for the future. But again, as I'm saying at the end of all my presentations, this is only a technique. I think that, on, I, I'm not, I think I believe the most important thing is uh, the answer that we want to have and uh, uh, on to our scientific question, and then the reliable use of this DVC in order to address this scientific question. Um, so, and it needs training, it needs practice, uh, uh, it needs reading. And in terms of training, we are doing fantastically well and uh, the, the, the field is growing and it will grow even more. So watch this space because there's a, 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 a DVC workshop that is gonna be organized uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, National X-ray Computer Tomography in the UK and uh, further details are following later in spring 2021. Now, one thing that I want to say, I presented this work but uh, there are a lot of people. First of all, I've tried to capture all of you uh, in relation to this presentation and apologies if uh, you don't see your name in there. Uh, and also the funding that is uh, vital for this, for, for, for uh, uh, the research to be conducted and to be, uh, to, to be, to be carried on. And, uh, um, but most importantly, I think that the core of the, any research project is uh, down to the early career researchers uh, and uh, here I'm just mentioning that there is no specific order, but at least of the early career researchers that I have supervised, co-supervised in some capacity, advised, this is really their fantastic work and uh, this is really uh, their fantastic contribution to all our research. So I just want to thank all of the people uh, that, that contributed to, uh, to this presentation and to the, the research here in general, uh, all of you for the attention, and I'm happy to uh, get your questions. Thank you very much, Gianluca. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. We have a few questions in the chat, and I'm uh, asking you all to put your uh, also your questions in the Q&A or in the chat, uh, and I will bring them up. But I'm going to take the opportunities to ask the first question. Um, and I think you have really clearly showed us the benefit here with full field measurements in situ loading experiments and so on, uh, and the future development capacity. Um, what do you see as the limitations? What is the bottlenecks for going deeper? Is it time? Is it resolution? I mean, imaging time. Is it resolution? Is it radiation damage, which I think you haven't mentioned so much about? Or where are, where are we sort of, where are we fighting at the moment to get even further? Um, yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's the, the the question of questions. I think that is is al is always a balance. As I was just uh, uh, saying before, um, if 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 you are going for uh, uh, faster uh, uh, resolved events that you can typically have in a synchrotron setting, so in that particular case, what you are looking at and what is the advantage. Is that uh, uh, you know this is uh, that can be imaged faster and uh, uh, you can have that the, the speed in your imaging that is uh, uh, that is helping the process and but on on the downside is uh, is, is the radiation that can be oops uh, 
I hope I don't have to go out. <laughs> there is there is a, a fantastic alarm that is uh, ringing in uh, my building. <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to be here. And uh, a very good timing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Um. I want to apologize with all of you. I try to to go out and come back, but I really need to get out of the building. Okay, then we don't thank know, you I very don't know much. How to, I, I can take my laptop outside. <laughs> you can try. Let's see I if can you can try. bring it with you. And as long as we can keep you on the I, line, we're very happy. Can you, can you give me one second, please? Yes. Okay, everybody, I think we will uh, keep ourselves busy for a few minutes uh, while we're waiting for Gianluca to come back. There is one question uh, in the chat that says, I'm curious to know if you or any other groups who you might have tried to use DVC on tendons or ligaments, given the structure of soft tissues, do you think it is possible to use DVC on tissues other than bones? Uh, and I will be happy to ask Gianluca that question in a few minutes, but I can also maybe give a tentative answer myself. It is one of the things that uh, we in my group at the moment is looking into. And as far as I'm aware, there is nobody that has so far published anything in this direction, at least, or at least very limited. Uh, to be able to image soft tissues such as tendons or ligament, one probably needs to go towards higher uh, degrees of face contrast or face enhancements. And um, the, let's say the imaging speed becomes more crucial as well because you have a lot of um, viscoelasticity in the tissue, meaning that you either need to hold your loading phase for a long time before imaging, or you need to have very quick imaging sessions. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's not so much else that is published there. Um, but I'm hoping that we will be able to bring that field forward in a, a year or a few. There is also a question in the Q&A, or there's two. Um, but I think those we will leave for Gianluca. Okay, um, oh, I yes. think I'm still here. <laughs> You're back. I'm, I'm back outside, so from a different, a different setting. So sorry, sorry again. Let's try to let's try to do it from here. Absolutely. So, Thank you very uh, much. What, what? No, no problem. Uh, it's just uh, just unfortunate. But um, what I wanted to say before is that it's just a matter of uh, uh, or trade-off in between uh, uh, getting what you want in terms of speed or uh, getting what you want in terms of. Uh, um, uh, resolution. So um, the idea is that there is no, there's not a perfect uh, uh, balance in between that. It always depends on uh, um, on what you do. I think the most important thing is really to acknowledge the limitations, because also in the study that uh, we did here. Uh, using face contrast, obviously done in a lab system, in a lab setting, uh, this was obviously very low, and there are limitations also also in there, in terms of in situ, in terms of uh, stress relaxation, and all these type of things. So the perfect recipe, uh, unfortunately, doesn't exist. It's all down to uh, um, basically uh, the, the person in trying to find the right balance and the right trade-off, and to check those things beforehand as much as possible. Thank you very much. We have a few questions here. I'm yes. going to take first. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation. Is there any limitations in the size of the sample that can be used with the DVC? Um, there is no limitation with the size of the samples that can be used for, for DVC. Um, it depends on uh, uh, obviously the type of system that you have and that you are using for imaging and having enough patterns from, uh, from uh, your sample to, to allow and to enable DVC uh, to work properly. So um, as I was showing, uh, you, you, can, you can think of doing it for, from clinical uh, CTs down to um, uh, basically very high resolution. Obviously, when you are increasing the resolution, also your field of view is, is going down. And uh, with the field of view, the size of your sample should be smaller. Um, but it, generally speaking, there is no limitation for that. 
Okay, thank you. Another question here. Uh, hi, great presentation. I'm from Uppsala University and I have a question concerning if there is any experience with doing DVC with MR images for soft tissues or combining both MR and CT data to show deformation across both hard and soft tissues. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is just a recent paper, if I'm not mistaken, that was, uh, uh, that was just published um, in an issue that I'm editing, and uh, uh, it was using MRI images. Um, I don't remember exactly if uh, uh, this combined MRI and CT, but definitely there is work done using DVC using MRI images, yes. Um, if uh, if there are any particular questions, as I said, also I, I showed my my email um, to all of uh, the attendees. Just feel free to drop me an email if you want to have some specific uh, uh, clarification or uh, I, if I can if I can help you in any way. Thank you. Then we have one more question here. Very interesting talk. Thanks. On slide 16, under five percent deformation in the elastic regime. Uh, you observed axial strains on the order of 25,000 microstrains, which is approximately two and a half times higher than bone yield value under compression. How can you explain this? Does it mean that bone experienced plastic deformation? I'm not sure if you can relate to that slide or if you can ex so say something slide, about the strain the values slide, in general. My 16 is, uh, uh, is the slide in relation to um, the, the clinical CT, right? I, I do not know and, and cannot remember the slide numbers, but maybe you can talk about the strain magnitudes in general and yeah. uh, sort of how well you can trust the values, let's say. Well, in, in fact, uh, this is the only, the, the only slide where uh, the, the values are not there because uh, the, the error and the reliability is still under investigation. So in this particular case in CT, what I, I'm showing here is just, uh, uh, is just the distribution without specifying uh, which type of uh, maximum and minimum values of the strain are in there. So if this is, uh, if this is the question in relation to this slide, the answer is uh, I'm giving you a distribution and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you where the tissue is in compression and in tension and nothing more. Okay, thank you. Maybe that is something that can be continued uh, afterwards if, uh, if there is more questions related to that. Um, then we have, uh, okay. So I think if there is no further questions, let me see if I have one more here in the Q&A. Uh, can bone samples be tested in wet conditions? Yes, of course. Uh, all, all, all the samples or most of the samples that uh, uh, we've been testing are in wet conditions. So uh, the loading devices, uh, um, they have uh, an environmental chamber. And basically this environmental chamber uh, can accommodate samples of a certain size. And uh, yeah, they can be tested uh, in situ and in, uh, uh, in, in wet conditions. Okay, and then one final question here. Uh, thanks for the overview, great overview of applications of DVC. DVC is a relatively young technology. What do you think or hope that we can have in 10 years time? What are the most exciting developments? Is it on the nanoscale? Is it larger field of view? Is it other tissues? Where should we go, basically? Oof. This is, um, again, a great question. I think that uh, what I was just saying, um, the, the first thing that maybe is, is important into, in, in the DVC is uh, for the DVC, DVC itself to refine uh, correlation and to uh, uh, incorporate um, different types of uh, 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 algorithms and to, to join local and, uh, and global family, which some, some uh, uh, applications and softwares are already started to do. And this is for the DVC itself. But I think that the power of this is combined to other techniques as well. So as I mentioned, fine element uh, uh, modeling or artificial intelligence. So uh, in, in my mind, there will be one day where I'm just uh, imaging one sample and uh, I already know uh, what is happening in that sample subjected to certain type of conditions. So this is really not in 10 years time, it's even more. But um, I think that uh, these, these are 
there are a lot of uh, uh, exciting developments uh, for, for, for DVC and the use of DVC. Um, I, I, I cannot pick one, but I think that in, 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 in five years' time, we will be a much better place because, uh, yeah, it is young. It is a, a, a relatively young technique, but I could experience, uh, at least in, uh, in, in the last few years, how the, uh, the technique was, uh, uh, you know, boosting in terms of applications and in terms of groups that they are using it uh, for, for different types of uh, tissues and biomaterials. So, um, yeah, this is just an, an overview of what I, what I think of that. Okay, thank you very much, Gianluca. So with that, uh, I would like to close the Q&A session here. And uh, thank you so much again once more from me. And then I want to hand over back to Marcus. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, Gianluca, for um, really a wonderful uh, discussion, moderation, and wonderful seminar, lots of insights, and even some, I think, pandemic-induced um, interesting occurrences like Fire Alarm doing a Zoom webinar. And I think this will be <laughs> This will be archived on YouTube forever. Um, and I think generations from now, we might be looking back at that, that time or years from now, we might be looking back at that time and remember un the unique circumstances we were in. Um, so uh, with that, uh, thank you again, um, and all of you for, um, for attending. We had a really healthy um, group again today. And um, as I mentioned, we will be posting this webinar as all the other ones on our YouTube channel. Um, watch out for announcements for the next webinar, which will be happening in January. Um, and uh, if you're interested in giving a webinar, please reach out to me, um, mbuehler at mit.edu, um, and I look forward to discussing with you. Um, with that being said, um, keep our journal in mind, submit your papers. Um, thank you for the reviewers that are among you, I'm sure, for all your hard work. And I wish you all a great uh, holiday season and a wonderful step and slip into the new year, which um, we all hope will be the beginning of something better and more positive. And um, we will be meeting again uh, then, um, thank you all.